Chers collègues, je vous propose de reprendre. On est un petit peu en retard pour le... Dear colleagues, uh, let's uh, pick up again. Uh, uh, the voting times have been sent, so we're a bit late with them, but it's fine. So let's uh, continue. We're at point eight. So we're going to vote the report of Gabriel Mato, the measures uh, for uh, the management and conservation of controls applicable in the Commission's competency in Fortuna in the Indian Ocean. Let's see if we've got a quorum. C'est bon. Allez, on est 11. Bon. We have a quorum. There's 11 of us. So we can vote. You've uh, received in your inbox the voting, the ballot. So you've got until 11.30 to vote. Excellent, then. The following point, 9. We're going to examine a draft report by Isabel Carvalhais developing a sustainable blue economy in the EU, the role of the fisheries and aquaculture sectors. Mrs Carvalhais, are you connected? And I'm going to give you the floor. And then uh, Mr Economo from DG Mare will also express his opinion. Go ahead, Mrs. Carvalho. Thank you very much, Chair, and hello to everyone. Now I'm the rapporteur for this own initiative report. And I just wanted to put you in the picture briefly. This is from the 19th of May of this year. The European Commission presented a communication for a new approach to the sustainable blue economy in the EU in line with the requirements of the uh, European Green Deal. And this is idea of making our economy more efficient, more competitive, more capable of eliminating CO2 emissions while at the same time protecting the environment, biodiversity, and at the same time not leaving anyone behind. So the Commission's communication is meant to define a broad agenda for reaching these goals. So substituting this idea of blue growth, which is unregulated, with an idea of a sustainable blue economy, which is based on the three pillars of sustainability, environmental, social, and economic. And it's these three pillars that I've organized this initiative report, which I'll be presenting to you, which are in line with the title of the report itself, Toward a Sustainable Blue Economy in the EU. So, looking at the various points covered by the report, well, I'd just like to focus on a few. First, to congratulate the Commission on the new Sustainable Blue Economy Initiative. But I also regret the fact that there's a lack of specific objectives for each of the sectors, particularly for fisheries and aquaculture. Now, it's true that we need to have guidance and legally binding instruments, at least that's what I feel, to have specific actions which will allow for a development of fisheries and agriculture which is resilient and competitive. We need to have a clear framework for action which is clear and which allows us to provide healthy food to our people while at the same time ensuring job creation and a future for our young people. So we need to have more actions than just a general uh, support for research, all that of course is important. We need to have research, innovation, and very importantly, we need to ensure that these actions really help specifically with protecting the biodiversity and uh, healthy ecosystems as laid down in the European Green Deal. So in all of this, we fishers really are out on the front lines of all of this. When it comes to the threat to loss of biodiversity, we can't forget that. So we, the fishers, really are the first to know that we're in the first lines in terms of socioeconomic impact as well when we lose biodiversity. So 
the fishers, whether we're talking about small-scale fishers or commercial fisheries or recreational fisheries, we recognize this urgency and need to take actions to protect our environment because it's only through more scientific knowledge, better scientific advice that we can really better develop public policies in order to ensure a sustainable blue economy. And an, along those lines, it's absolutely essential to ensure the value chains are sustainable as well, involving small-scale fishers, ensuring the harmonization of selective fishing gears, non-destructive and energy-efficient fishing methods. And in this report, I also say that Despite all of the very important steps that have been taken in recent years and the past decade in order to try and modernize our fleet and diversify the sectors in the blue economy, which, as we know, covers all the different industries related to our oceans and our seas, our coastal areas, and even also land-based aquaculture, that despite all of the efforts and the progress that have been made, we still see that there are a number of different sectors which have opposing visions and opposing goals. And this is particularly concerning when we see that there's a lack of a general a management of our marine areas along strategic lines. And this leads to harm for the most fragile industries such as small scale fisheries. So what we need is that the EU and member states need to work together to respond to this lack of maritime spatial planning, which is strategic. Because our sectors really uh, is an essential part of our ecosystem and it's all on the shoulders of our fishers. So just before I conclude, Chair, let me um, also say in this report that I also refer to the more traditional activities and the importance of them. A sustainable blue economy needs to be able to include a balanced development of all different activities, also modern ones, innovative biotechnologies, ocean-based technologies, blue tourism. But at the same time, we need to ensure the continuity and sustainability of the more traditional activities, maritime transport, fisheries, aquaculture, which are at the center of this report. So we need to work together with the Commission, with the Member States, with regional authorities and local authorities as well, to promote uh, fisheries plans that are coordinated. We need to have a dialogue across the EU that allows us to strike the right balance between the different forces and the different stakeholders to promote cooperation and share experience in a conflict resolution. When it comes to international governance of our oceans and the question of the blue economy in the EU, we need to address environmental matters from a territorial standpoint. That's another important part that's message of this report. I don't want to go on for too much longer, but also I talk about competitiveness and economic performance of the fisheries sector, saying that it's important that we need to pay particular attention to traditional um, methods to lifelong learning, to the dissemination of technological and scientific uh, advances, new technologies, and all of the different measures that will make uh, stronger fisheries. Also bring, bringing it out to universities and schools and industry to ensure that we can have actions that are based on the best available scientific advice to improve the work of our fishers to ensure economic growth and competitiveness of our sectors while at the same time ensuring the environmental sustainability. And finally, let me just say that, and this is also in the report, that we talk about value chains and ensuring sustainable fisheries in these value chains, that we must think about our coastal communities. We need to ensure they are the underpinnings of a society in those areas. They are a source of jobs and food and growth. And there's a lot of opportunities in these sectors and much more representation in decision-making processes. So these are just a few of the main points of this report, which I would like to highlight for you. There are others as well. But I await with great interest any comments that you may have. And I'm sure that altogether we can work 
to ha play a role that we need to truly contribute to a solid future for fisheries and aquaculture within the framework of a sustainable blue economy. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. I see Gabriel Mato has raised his hand. I don't know if it was to confirm the vote, but perhaps it was also because Gabriel wanted to take the floor. Perhaps you could confirm that to me. Thank you, Chair. It was actually because I wanted to take the floor, but I did want to speak on this point, actually. Yes, well, after the shadow rapporteurs then, says the Chair. So for the EPP, Claudio Montero de Aguiar. Hello, thank you, Chair. Uh, hello to everyone. My thanks to Isabel for that presentation that she's just made to us. Now, we do know that the blue economy is one of the most diversified sectors we have. Now, it's already been said, but we really need to have shared objectives of conserving and recovering marine ecosystems. Now, Isabel quite rightly said that there's this need to support fishers because they are really on the front lines. She said that. They're really at the, f the, the those in most involved in our seas and our oceans. They have been affected, of course, by the pandemic and the resulting crisis caused by COVID-19. But we also know that this is a sector which is quite resilient and has proven that it can bounce back over the years. So all measures really should be focused on them and helping them. There's a lot of potential here, but this is a point that was made, and let me just underline this, that we need to ensure the implementation of uh, cross-cutting policies where we also take into account other sectors. Fisheries, yes, but also tourism, aquaculture, research, and, of course, renewable energies. Now, we urgently need to deal with uh, climate change, but we can't forget in the process that there are traditional activities as well, and we need to think about what we can do to help them because they are the sustenance of our um, coastal communities, small-scale fisheries, artisanal fisheries. So we want to avoid a situation where we're creating competition for resources. No. There's something else here, I should say, which is that we need to create a POSE scheme for fisheries, for transport. And that's something we need to consider, is particularly for outermost regions. Now, we know that outermost regions hold a lot of potential, but also face a lot of uh, challenges and conditions that make it harder for us and make us more isolated. We're more fragile regions. But we've proven that we're very rich in terms of biodiversity. And they can and should be considered pilot regions when it comes to governance of our oceans. And when it comes to implementing projects for sustainable fisheries or uh, ocean conservation. Now, this is something I've done on a number of occasions in other reports. But let me just say it again now. The eldermost regions of Europe really can and should hold a center for uh, fighting pollu plastic pollution. This is a project that really needs to be implemented. It's something that could be repl replicated elsewhere as well. We need to think about all of the different interests at stake when it comes to defining these policies. So. We also need to highlight this need for an ongoing dialogue between sectors. I can give you an example. The creation of marine protected areas, for instance. There, we need to involve all st stakeholders, all sectors, tourism, fisheries, the scientific and aquaculture communities. Here, I can't emphasize enough just how important it is to ensure that we have the knowledge of uh, past years 
of 50 years of marine protected areas in the Illa Salvages in Madeira. This is a protected area that uh, was extended very recently and which allows Portugal to have the largest marine protected area in all of Europe. Now, all of this was defined by consensus, including all different stakeholders. It wasn't a unilateral imposition. It was based on scientific studies and communications with local fishing communities. The chair, if you could conclude, please. Yes, yes, I'm about to wrap up, chair. I was just saying that this is the added value that we see we can do with everybody pulling together. It's a practical example. So just to conclude, let me say, now in addition to ensuring cooperation to protect stocks in these marine protected areas, we can also create new jobs and other opportunities. My apologies for taking a bit long. I'm very much on the side of the rapporteur to ensure that we can work together to better improve even more this very excellent document. Thank you. Thank you. We now have, uh, well, thank you for speaking for your team. We understand that you would want to speak at length and with great passion about that. Uh, that is, of course, our role and our responsibility to recall that fisheries and aquaculture need to play a central role of the sustainable blue economy. For many years, fisheries was completely excluded from this idea of blue growth. So it's important for us to remember that to remember that the maritime economy, the blue economy, needs to be taken as a whole. It is all activities, those that are more traditional, but also those that involve innovation and developments, and all different activities that are emerging as well. So we need to be able to include all of this in a report to ensure that we can have a balanced development of our territories and blue development of our oceans within the framework of the European Green Deal. So I will be submitting amendments on four main points. We already talked, I think, under the own initiative report about the attractiveness of the profession. I think that's very important if we want to have a blue economy and a dynamic coastal communities. Well, we need to make the profession interesting, and I will be submitting amendments to that end. There's another point that uh, is very near and dear to me, and I know many colleagues share the interest in the whole idea of algae aquaculture, which is very important. It's a good job creator in our coastal communities. It's also important when it comes to uh, tackling the major climate challenges and meeting the aims of the Green Deal. And there's another point which Ms. Cavalier quite rightly raised, which is this need to have le combining legal instruments in place. Since the beginning of this legislative term, we've been spending a lot of time looking at strategies, action plans. But behind all of this, at some point, we all need to nail it down in something that is a, a legislative instrument with is binding in nature. Well, to conclude as well, I don't want to go on too long, but um, let me just say that for some years now, we've seen a number of different documents that have allowed us to regulate this whole question. I'm thinking of planning, which looks not just at the question of regulating maritime activities. It's also regulating the abilities to develop maritime activities within an environmental framework, which is, creates constraints. So we can't just speak at an abstract level of the different capacities that are well regulated. Regulated is not just banning, it is agreed and approved. So I will be submitting amendments along those lines. Thank you again for this very interesting report and very good work. I think it takes the question of fisheries and aquaculture and puts it really where it belongs in the conversation about the blue economy. So those would be my comments. I now give the floor to Ms. O'Sullivan for the Greens. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, uh I agree this is a, a hugely important uh, area, sustainable blue economy and the role of fisheries and aquaculture um, sectors. And I'd like to uh, congratulate um, the rapporteur, Isabel, on a very good report. Um, and particularly for us in the Green Group, uh, the focus on conservation and sustainable management um, aspects of the topic including the focus on the commitments of the biodiversity strategy. 
also um, similar to you, Chair, uh, we welcome the calls for the legally binding targets for the recovery and res restoration um, of uh, marine ecosystems. Because if we don't have legally binding targets, uh, we won't really have um, the focus and the, um, the uh, uh, integrity to actually to uh, make things happen. So they must be legally binding. Uh, also, I'd like to note the importance that the Marine Spatial Planning Directive will play in the coming years for a sustainable blue economy that transcends national borders. So we'd like to underline the importance of reforming SFPA agreements with thir third countries so that they are actually sustainable and truly sustainable and that they include a reference to uh, Article 17 of the CFP. So we feel that is a particularly important area. So uh, just once again to congratulate the Rapporteur on a really good report. Um, we will uh, contribute to it uh, with amendments and we very much look forward to working with the Rapporteur uh, on the development of the report. Thank you very much, Chair. Merci. Thank you. The floor now is to Ms. Tardino, here in the room. Everybody? Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I'd very much like to thank the Rapporteur for her work uh, on this uh, report. Uh, I think this text is a good starting point with a lot of very interesting uh, paragraphs that I can share, but I don't agree with the uh, request for specific uh, measures for fishers and agriculture to bring in, as it says in the European Commission uh, report, uh, that uh, these uh, elements, uh, the fact that it uh, lines uh, up uh, with the European Green Deal, responds to the urgent uh, reading. I think it's also very important uh, that we, as when we talk about the role of young people and women in this generational change, uh, particularly in islands, and uh, the uh, uh, bringing in uh, academia, authorities, companies and uh, uh, universities on board. I think that's very important because it brings the economic in line with the uh, uh, environmental issues. When we talk about uh, guaranteeing uh, uh, decent working conditions, I think that's very important because it's a difficult uh, working sector. However, there are contradictory uh, measures which uh, come up uh, hard against the everyday realities of the sector. I think as it's very good to have a blue economy, but uh, we need to also allow the sector to survive uh, from the social and economic point of view. If you just uh, look at uh, territorial uh, approaches uh, or having too strict a set of uh, rules, uh, that can hold things back. Uh, so we need to move towards say, more sustainable uh, fishing and aquaculture, certainly, but we have to help uh, these uh, uh, through uh, gradually adapting to the changes and not a sort of race against time. I think it's very important when we look at the uh, bringing in the directive uh, on uh, taxing energy uh, products. Uh, I think they need to be excluded for the fishing sector because uh, it would uh, be uh, lethal or fatal for them to bring in additional uh, costs on, uh, for the fishermen. We need to uh, see the important uh, role of fishermen as the guardians, as the seas uh, and aquaculture. We need uh, to uh, have a s simplification of the uh, uh, territorial specifications and really make sure that we can in achieve uh, this uh, transition without killing off the sector altogether to move towards a, a more uh, competitive uh, economy which uh, doesn't uh, turn its back on this noble and traditional activity. I think that's the best way forward. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. The floor is to Mr. Chich now. Thank you, Chair. Pozdravljam novu strategiju. When it comes uh, to the blue economy in the EU, I'm concerned about the lack of uh, specific goals for fishing and aquaculture. Fishing and aquaculture are the most important sector of the blue economy because uh, uh, of uh, the supply of uh, healthy food. We have seen how important it is uh, during this pandemic, which caused uh, enormous problems uh, to the 
the fishing and the aquaculture sectors. But in spite of this, they regularly supply the fish for food. And uh, this uh, is an incentive. We have uh, to continuously monitor the situation. So I agree with the rapporteur that information gathering is key uh, for sustainable management of fishing. I am also concerned by the fact that we still don't know how we arrived at 30 percent of uh, protected uh, uh, maritime areas and 10 percent of strictly protected uh, areas. Uh, I think we should have had uh, an impact assessment uh, uh, to see how it affects fishing before arriving at these uh, specific figures. Also, I'm concerned about the rise of new activities uh, in the uh, area of uh, the blue economy. It's not that I'm against new activities, but we have to see how they affect fishing, what their impact is. We heard the fisherman from the Netherlands who spoke about uh, uh, how much uh, uh, the uh, wind um, uh, reduced their uh, the the wind um, uh, electric uh, mills uh, reduced their fishing opportunities. So we have to see how these new activities will affect the fishing sector. I support the report, but I will be tabling amendments which I hope will contribute to the report. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'd like to start by uh, thanking Isabel for this uh, draft report. Now, the e blue economy is so broad-ranging, as we know, but we were able to um, identify an approach that really focuses on fisheries. I think that the approach here might have been a bit restrictive, focusing specifically on the blue economy in terms of uh, how it deals with it. Uh, without taking into account a deep sea mining, bio, biotechnology, or other new technologies, and that we need to have a broader definition of the concept, taking into account different sectoral and intersectoral activities related to our oceans, seas, and coastal areas, including activities related to uh, fisheries and aquaculture, tourism, and others. Now, our development of the sector really requires solid investment, which ensures the best. Uh, knowledge and uh, development of the marine area, no, promoting small-scale fisheries, traditional fisheries, while at the same time considering uh, needs of uh, commun coastal communities and uh, helping them develop. In this way, we need to ensure a proper use of our uh, marine resources while at the same time opening up new markets, new development opportunities, and I'd even say a dimension, uh, a new dimensions of fisheries. So in particular, we need to have new financial instruments made available, N new structural funds, investment funds, the EMFAF, the European Social Fund, the Cohesion Fund, but also create other instruments such as those that were referred to already. And we actually have a proposal looking at that, a creation or recovery or of the POSE scheme for fisheries and also transport, which could more accurately respond to the needs of island and outermost regions. So to conclude, we see that the contribution of small-scale fisheries and aquaculture to a sustainable blue economy is clear. And we need, of course, to... We will, of course, contribute with uh, proposed amendments along those lines to try and ensure that we take into account the need to modernize fleets, to ensure uh, better uh, transport links and other points. thinking in particular of the concerns of island regions so that we can go beyond what is already laid down. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll now give the floor to Mr. Mato, who is asking to speak. Thank you very much, Chair. 
Thank you and congratulations to Isabel for her report. And now she's pointed out quite rightly that the growth of new activities in the blue economy is facing uh, more uh, or is providing more competition in traditional fishing uh, areas. We need to have interaction between the different maritime and uh, land actions, uh, activities of uh, the blue economy to benefit all. I totally agree with that approach. From the territorial approach uh, must uh, play an active role without uh, infringing upon these uh, less negotiable areas. And the st strategy by the Commission of drastically extending uh, uh, energy uh, generation in the high seas is something that needs to be taken into consideration. We need to have an effective uh, integration of all of these areas. What I don't entirely share is her approach, the rapporteur's approach, that we have to have a greener blue economy and focus on the uh, green transition. I think we need to look at the social aspects of the uh, blue economy and the vital role of fishing and uh, agriculture in uh, all of these uh, chains and uh, traditional cultures and protecting those to allow the blue economy to really be blue. We're concerned how we can ensure that uh, uh, fishing and agriculture can really have a, a, a preponderant role in this. So I want to see uh, how we can push this forward while protecting the livelihoods and the traditions of the traditional uh, fishing sectors. Thank you. And, um, Rose, uh, you say if we take uh, the, uh, uh, the blue out of green, we'll end up with yellow. Yes, well, thank you, uh, Chair. I'd like to thank the rapporteur for, his, uh, for her draft uh, report, which is a real key to the blue economy, but the blue economy needs to remain green. So, uh, seriously now, though, on the uh, draft uh, report, uh, what she's saying about uh, fishing, we need to underline the role that the Commission and the Member States need to take uh, to promote more selective uh, 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 fishing methods, as the rapporteur said, and also outline uh, the, uh, uh, the role of uh, making this more attractive to young people and how we can support a small artisanal uh, uh, fishers who actually uh, feed us and keep our, our communities alive. But to go a little bit further, we would propose uh, specific uh, um, measures to have really sustainable fishing, to have more selective fishing and use uh, fishing uh, methods which uh, do not harm the economy, so not looking at uh, uh, various uh, fishing methods which are harmful. So we need to look at coastal fishing or artisanal fishing and uh, look at the bio strategy, uh, uh, biodiversity strategy for 2030, 30% of uh, European waters with 10% strictly protected. The a rapporteur in the develop in the DEVI committee uh, in the development uh, the developing countries we need to have uh, a development of these zones which are based on human rights uh, and the support of local communities and autochthonous communities uh, and of course uh, uh, keep at bay the uh, uh, extractive industries particularly the oil industries now I'd like to uh, thank uh, I'd like to uh, underline uh, the uh, um, question of uh, pelagic stocks in West Africa, particularly uh, sardine, and uh, see how uh, we can look at this whole issue of fish feed and uh, how we can move towards uh, other uh, species like non carnivorous species and to have a uh, due diligence uh, for the entire uh, agriculture uh, supply chain so we can have uh, trace uh, proper tracing so we can do away with uh, IUU fish coming into the uh, food chain and particularly in terms of uh, uh, West Africa we will need the EU to have uh, more data on the status of pelagic stocks uh, artisanal fishers uh, and uh, local communities quite uh, clearly show that uh, their numbers are going down every year and uh, food uh, uh, sovereignty uh, means that more and more young people are moving to Europe and this this uh, sustainable European fisheries will just uh, be an illusion unless we can have proper sustainability. Thank you, Madam Rose. Anybody else wishing to speak? Mr. Economo, 
are you on line with us? Uh, do you have any comments that you wish to make at this uh, juncture? Thank you. Yes, uh, good morning, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes? Hell yeah. Yes, okay. Um, so uh, I'm very pleased to uh, be able to also address you this morning. I have to thank the rapporteur uh, for the report uh, and for her presentation, actually, because she definitely covered very well the context of this communication. And I think yourself also mentioned uh, the importance of looking into those maritime sectors that they form the blue economy together. Uh, we do agree, of course, and we understand the uh, interest of your um, committee on the two sectors that we call often traditional, uh, and uh, they are uh, also at the, at, the, at the heart of the blue economy, aquaculture and uh, fisheries. But it is true as well uh, that our communication uh, puts all this together, I think, in a new context, in a new approach. You yourself referred to uh, the, the um, previous um, uh, line of policy called blue growth, which was not referring uh, to fisheries at all. Now we are looking in all these sectors together and uh, we are putting them in not an action plan, but on a strategy, on a strategic approach of how we would like uh, them to progress, how we would like them to develop in the context of the blue economy, in the context of the biodiversity strategy. Now, now we have uh, put together uh, this communication, not only for implementation by the Commission, but by the member states, by the stakeholders. So we provide here, I think, a very good instrument for the future. Now coming to some specific points that have been raised, I believe uh, the competition of space, it is indeed at the heart of the matter. We have a very good instrument on this with the, uh, the uh, Maritime Special Planning Directive and the Member States had been obliged to, to set up those plans. It is not an easy task, it is true. The Commission will report on the implementation of the Directive next year and uh, it provides also this uh, type of difficult uh, decision-making uh, context, but which is necessary. Uh, we are here in sometimes have to deal with conflicting priorities. The regions, the member states, the neighboring countries actually need to work together in developing those plans. Now, uh, coming specifically to um, some of the targets that you are asking us to set uh, for aquaculture and fisheries, just to remind you that uh, the, we have uh, also at the same time, more or less, as issuing this communication, uh, there were we issued the guidelines for sustainable aquaculture. And this definitely is the place where we set our targets, where we explain uh, the policy we would like to and the direction we would like aquaculture to take in the future. So that was a very, I think, strategic document consulted with member states for a long time. And I think it provides, as I said, the good basis. Now, on the fisheries, you know also that uh, our colleagues uh, in, the, um, uh, in the fisheries department of uh, DT Mare are working for producing an action plan uh, on uh, to conserve fisheries resources for spring next year. We are working on a report on the common fisheries policy also uh, by the end of next year. So all the elements that you are asking uh, will find their place there. And I think it will help us in, in discussing um, about uh, these uh, two sectors in, uh, in the context of uh, in the mid and the long term. Um, now, other elements that I would like to highlight, uh, you said yourself, we need to have um, uh, to keep the coherence of how we develop new activities. Yes, the offshore wind farms and the targets we have set under the climate change mitigation measures, under the climate package, really oblige us to look into those activities to see how we uh, offer synergies among sectors. I'm saying this because we, as I said, need to find solutions to combine uh, the development of sectors and for this dialogue is necessary. I agree with you. In our communication, we are 
also clearly states the need for having a blue forum. Uh, bring together the different stakeholders uh, for their understanding and understanding also the opportunities. Uh, this is a, a, a very important thing that comes with the blue economy. There is potential in developing it with the right, uh, of course, uh, conditions. I also heard, and I'm going very quickly through the points made uh, to, to catch with the time, uh, the, the That's a good idea because you have to conclude. Thanks. Exactly. So I leave that for the end. This is the final remark. The social aspects is indeed uh, highlighted in our communication. The aspect related to the women for, in blue economy, we refer to that. that the, uh, the importance of the outermost regions, we do refer to that. And also the importance of research and innovation, both for aquaculture and um, fisheries, but also all the sectors because the research and innovation will promote also the synergies that we would like to, to have between those sectors. I conclude here and thank you very much for... for... Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, colleague, uh, for your contributions. That helps us to uh, feed into the report that we're making. I'd like to give the floor now back to our rapporteur, Madame Carvalhais, to uh, uh, come back to the different points that have been made. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Thank you very much indeed to all of you colleagues uh, for the very constructive way in which you have uh, approached this uh, proposal, uh, the draft uh, report. I think uh, it's very important for us to have a broad agreement on the main points, the main focus of these uh, reports. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, the Chair has uh, summarised very well what uh, these uh, points are that we all agree upon. And I think we've got a big uh, uh, area of agreement to work together. Of course, there are different visions, different views and ways of doing this because uh, I think we share the same objectives, but we sometimes have different ideas about how to achieve them. And uh, that's always a very stimulating uh, approach as we table our amendments and we uh, uh, propose new texts to try and bridge these gaps, these different interpretations we have. Just uh, talking about uh, the green or blue, depending uh, on uh, the uh, colours we're looking at. A cyan blue, I think, is the ideal colour, uh, uh, rather than turquoise. So somewhere between green and blue, I'm thinking. And I think that's where we can find the sustainability, which brings together the three pillars which is environmental and social and economic. So let's all work together and I'm sure we can all achieve that. Once again, let me say I'm open to any comments and uh, suggestions you might make. I think this will be a very constructive job of work we'll all be doing together as uh, we uh, move forward with this initiative. Thank you very much to you all. Well, thank you very much, Well, from uh, my region. Uh, we have a a word uh, for that uh, in Brittany uh, between it's called glaze in uh, Breton between grey and blue and green we have a word so 13th of December at 5 p.m. that will be the time for voting on the report uh, for February 2022 that's the timing thank you very much indeed Madame Carvalhais I suggest that we move on to item 10 now of our agenda we continue on uh, in, in the report. We're now going to look at artisanal fishing. Our colleague from the left, Juan Pimenta Lopes, is the rapporteur. He is going to outline uh, his uh, report to, to us and then we'll give the uh, floor to the uh, the uh, shadows. Uh, Madame Lena, uh, she's also with us online to hear the uh, Commission, uh, the European Commission's input. So I'll give the floor now to Mr. Lopez Pimenta. Chair, uh, dear shadows, colleagues, uh, small scale fishing, artisanal and uh, coastal fishing is very significant in the context of uh, the EU member states and uh, allows us to have operative uh, in terms of the operative conditions and using fishing gears that are covered in uh, fisheries policies. So three quarters uh, of uh, the uh, fleet is uh, engaged in these activities uh, and therefore 
this is a way of uh, ensuring uh, food security and food sovereignty of many communities and this also helps uh, to build the socio and economic uh, fabric of the uh, local communities, the job creation uh, and upstream and downstream uh, approaches and also of course uh, protecting local cultures. Now we've uh, seen a big uh, uh, contribution in terms of uh, a GDP and uh, we need to look at the situation of the fleets uh, and uh, the uh, crews and we see that there's a lack of labor force uh, throughout. Uh, uh, people are not keen to join the sector because it uh, doesn't pay very well and uh, the conditions are somewhat dangerous uh, so we need to attract young people to uh, fishing. Now small-scale and artisanal fishing is perhaps uh, the most sustainable type of fishing which has a proper uh, management of, re of resources and is also able to produce the greatest uh, uh, GDP input uh, providing better quality fish apart from its socio-economic uh, uh, value and the input that it has to really support so many communities that live from fishing so it's no good to just say we need to do more about small-scale fishing we need concrete measures to safeguard and promote to this and make it more attractive to the younger generations we need to hear the input from its uh, stakeholders we need statistics uh, but we don't just want pretty uh, videos and uh, uh, posters we want action we need to understand there are so many problems that all these uh, ports uh, uh, suffer there is low income uh, high uh, uh, production cost that uh, particularly now that uh, fuel is more expensive the need for modernization uh, the use uh, of uh, uh, mode of engine capacity which is being used uh, to uh, govern a lot of these factors and uh, the use of uh, uh, community funds which is very hard because there's so much red tape involved and sometimes it's hard to harness those funds and uh, we can see this uh, by the fact that the EMFAF is not sufficient to support the needs of the sector and this particular segment in particular. Now the use uh, of a small scale uh, uh, artisanal and coastal fishing uh, particularly in view of the particular problems facing the sector we need to have uh, uh, a lot more information for young people, we need to improve uh, the uh, conditions for working on this. All of these are the basis of this uh, report. For example, strengthening the interventions in the value chain, uh, increasing uh, a sales uh, value so that we have a, a proper distribution of the value in uh, the value chain that will help to improve the income of fishermen looking at uh, 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 local markets, local uh, food chains so that we can really shorten these uh, supply chains. Sh uh, small scale fishing is a way of keeping down uh, the costs and making it more sustainable. It's a, a, and to have a mechanism which can help to support and bolster incomes in low production periods. Doing away with uh, red tape of course is very important so people can have access to funds improving the system for financing and pre-financing. All of this is important. We also want to have renewal, qualification and modernization and the resizing of the small scale fishing fleet. Uh, considering the, the uh, aging uh, of the fleet uh, and the vessels and uh, we need all of these things to make this more uh, environmentally sustainable and also to support the uh, fishing communities that live from this activity. We need to have uh, technical and uh, financial uh, um, resources directed towards research to help uh, to improve and uh, the, uh, the system by bringing in better and more data. Now the report that I have uh, uh, presented is just a very incomplete uh, basis. So we've got a fairly limited uh, number of um, uh, characters for this and uh, as I say it's very incomplete. 
we need to bring in the, the uh, enormous diversity of the uh, small-scale uh, uh, fishing. But I think we need to have this basis so that we can move towards meeting the needs of the sector. Other points of analysis which require greater analysis are uh, operational safety, uh, markets uh, in fishing and uh, aquaculture, particularly as concerns uh, small-scale fishing and the impact on other um, fishing or uh, maritime production systems, the role of uh, fishing lines, the support uh, of producers' organizations, fishing in internal uh, uh, inland uh, waters, and of course the outlying uh, regions. But essentially we need to look at uh, the uh, small-scale fishing within the framework of the Common Fisheries Policy and the evaluation that were made by the Commission at the end of uh, next year is going to be very important. The, there is a con continuing centralization of uh, this uh, uh, policy when in fact what we need is more local management. We need a decentralization and I call on uh, the uh, members and the shadow rapporteurs to provide a greater input so we can have a proper reflection of this uh, sector and get a proper view of how this really works, particularly because we're looking at the future of small-scale fishing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's start with the shadows. Montero de Guerra for EPP. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. I'd very much like to thank the uh, rapporteur for the uh, uh, outline that he's made. I've had the chance to talk to him uh, directly about this, but uh, what João has just presented really for us is uh, a draft which is uh, already very well balanced with uh, a very important considerations considering small-scale artisanal fishing and uh, from our point of view we can say that uh, at the outset we agree with uh, this initial draft. It uh, as he has said, uh, it focuses on essential elements for sustainability of small-scale fishing, uh, increasing the income, uh, making better use of uh, fish, uh, helping to uh, support the sales channels uh, and uh, providing the support uh, for uh, small-scale vessels. They're in a very precarious state and they uh, uh, put the lives of the people working on these vessels at, uh, at risk. So, we think this is a very well-balanced report as it stands. What I think is vital to mention, and uh, this is uh, very much the order of the day, it's not just up to the European Commission, but many of the colleagues in this, com in this uh, uh, committee, including the members of this committee, I think, need to understand that from a point of view of environmental sustainability, when we talk about small-scale fishing, this can only be achieved if we have better vessels, better ships, better boats. They have to be more efficient in terms of energy consumption, they need to be less polluting. And uh, we're not uh, talking about increasing the fishing effort, we're talking about uh, optimizing the existing fishing uh, effort. Uh, everybody, I think, is prepared to reduce the number of vessels in favour of having more efficient fishing vessels. It can be at sea for longer, so uh, to make the improvement uh, on the docks uh, for uh, landing the catches and unloading the catches. So we're talking about uh, uh, safety for fishermen, we're talking about food safety, we're talking about efficiency and we want to make this a more attractive activity for young people and we can only do that by improving these conditions. I'm sorry if I, you uh, hear me keep talking about uh, vessels. It's much more important to uh, replace and improve the vessels than have them sailing longer but being less efficient. In Madeira, uh, the average age of these fishing vessels is 50 years old. Uh, Many of them are not able to put out to sea because the health authorities don't think they're even fit uh, for people to be working on. So this is under threat. Uh, 
if we didn't have this public uh, support to buy uh, new and purchase new vessels, uh, the uh, disappearance of this fleet is only a question of time. So let me round off saying we need a small scale fishing fleet that needs to have sustainable fishing really uh, put into practice with enormous uh, added value. So we're all going to work hand in hand, as João has said, to really come up uh, with a well-balanced report that really is a mirror, a reflection of the reality on the ground and at sea. So thank you very much for your attention. Merci. Thank you. Pietro Bartolo. Thank you, Chair. First of all, I'd like to thank our colleague Pimenta for the text he has presented. I think it's an excellent base for the work we need to do and I think it's a very important work given the subject because uh, uh, small artisanal fishing is the biggest sector in the EU in terms of numbers of vessels but also the human resources. However, the attention to small fisheries isn't enough. It's usually still a sector that's underrepresented, that's got dire structural problems, and it's usually always the underdog, and it's risking its very survival. And this means that we might lose this huge heritage that it, it carries. What does small scale fishery mean? We have a regulation in the, of course, but it doesn't really take into account all the idiosyncrasies and the multiple aspects. The, we, have, we are in a position of weakness because small fishers don't have control on the prices of the catch because they can't collectively bargain for it. So they have margins that are very small when it comes to selling their catch. And then there's always difficulty to having access to where you sell the products and the tools that you can have. Small fisheries are always in competition with all other sectors such as a blue economy and renewables that renewable energy plants are increasingly in the seas which cut down on the spaces that the artisanal fisheries have and then there's the problem of marine pollution and the unfair distribution of the fishery quotas that we've just started to tackle with the initiative report. There is the issue of uh, the fleet becoming older and older. There is no new generation wanting to come in. So there are a lot of difficulties. They're not homogenous. And then there's the issue of how you co-manage the protected marine areas, how you promote tourism without negative impact on these limited spaces. So there is a lot to work of work to do. But I think that we will have a final text that will be clear and will give us a clear roadmap to how make small artisanal fisheries a sustainable sector that will remain a strategic sector for all the countries that have a coastline and especially in the Mediterranean. So thank you very much. Thank you, your colleague. Well, I'm going to take again the word as representative Renew. So first of all, thank you to our colleague Pimenta Lopez for this uh, draft report, which highlights the importance of small fish, uh, the, the small and artisanal fishing in uh, the fishery sector. I'm going to highlight a couple of uh, aspects on the common uh, fisheries policies. Uh, 
the left has uh, always said that uh, the uh, common fisheries policies is a loss of sovereignty for the member states and it has a uh, fallout on the human aspect so I'm going to um, present an amendment on this but I think that for artisanal fishing and coastal fishing has to develop uh, visions um, based on the basins you have to regionalize because then you can see that there might be things in common in 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 same basins fishing basins so today we should delve deeper into that because it's not taken it enough into account and it's true that decisions in brussels are very general and they're generally applied wherever and although the coastline is very different, and so we should perhaps do it by basin. For on sustainability, we have to... I think that the report says that uh, small coastal fishing can be sustainable. It's true, but sometimes the opposite is true. So we have to be able for this small coastal fishing activity to be uh, in the context of the economic uh, realities of the territory and see what it can do so that we can guarantee the revenues and the security of the sector. And as revenues go, uh, I have... I was vice president of the region, and so I have a first-hand experience of how the fund is um, used. And we have to have a package of specific funds oriented to these small fishers so that they can have access to the funds because they're very complicated, they're very complex. And for these small fishers, sometimes it's so difficult to access, to create the dossier. It could, it could cost thousands of euros, so they just give up and they don't even bother applying. Uh, so I think that we have the tools. The discussion we've had on FAF show that we have tools to invest, to renew, uh, to change the engines, to create greater safety in the vessels. But I think that the Commission should now focus on making them more accessible to these small fishers. So thank you very much, your colleagues, for all your contributions. I am convinced that our report can be very interesting for our committee. And now the floor is to Ms. D'Amato. She's not there. Does anyone else? Grace? Grace, for the Greens. Grace. Yes. Thank you, uh, Chair, and um, thank you to uh, the rapporteur, uh, Joe uh, Pinamento Lopez, for uh, this very good uh, report. Um, unfortunately, my colleague, uh, the shadow, Rosa D'Amato, couldn't be present here today. So I am going to read um, her considerations uh, on the report. Um, and uh, from her part, a big thanks to um, her colleague, Joe, for this. And the committee, this committee has often discussed policies that would support small-scale fisheries, a segment that has a lower impact on the environment and plays a vital role for coastal communities. Unfortunately, member states have often blocked this support, such as the case of the MFAF. The report that we discussed today provides an opportunity for the Parliament to express its support for this seg segment once again. According to STEC, small-scale fisheries account for 48% of the employment in the fisheries sector, but only uh, for 7.5% uh, of the gross tonnage. This suggests the need for a shift in EU policies to enable the segment to continue to play a key role in coastal communities. 
So we fully support many of the con concepts that have already been included in the text, such as the need to shorten supply chains to promote local consumption, the importance of promoting higher incomes, the need to increase safety and improve living conditions, and the importance of attracting new generations and promoting the role of women. We look forward to working with the Rapporteur to improve the text, especially on the need to strengthen the involvement of small-scale fishers in the decision-making process, the importance of allowing small-scale fishers to diversify their income and work in other sectors of the blue economy, the importance of providing technical assistance at the local level to enable them to access existing MFAF support the need to support the inclusion of small-scale fisher, uh, small scale, uh, in the identification, management and monitoring of marine protected areas, and finally the importance of applying Article 17 of the Common Fisheries Policy and ensure that small-scale is allocated a, a fair share of fishing opportunities, an issue that our colleague Caroline Rose is working on in this committee already and that constitutes a key priority for our group. So the Shadow Rapporteur, uh, Mr Manto, would like to take the opportunity to thank the Rapporteur once again uh, on behalf of herself and on behalf of the uh, Greens and she welcomes very much uh, working um, uh, with the Rapporteur on this INE going forward. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Mrs. Conte for ID. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, I would like to express my compliments to our colleague Pimenta Lopez, who has really well caught the situation of small scale fisheries and its needs. We have often in our committee uh, talked about the problems of the small scale fishers and given a pandemic, the uh, increased fuel prices, etc. We need to really promote and increase the support to guarantee them uh, the good working conditions and enough of a revenue. And so I agree with the proposals in the draft, especially those uh, concern better use of MFAF. So our amendments uh, go towards strengthening the increase of the use of mitigation measures uh, to face uh, uh, the obstacles of small scale fisheries, the enhancement of the role of women in uh, family scale concerns, and the bigger involvement of uh, the stakeholders in decision-making processes and the greater enhancement of the value of uh, local products. And we're open to that dialogue to give greater guarantees to coastline fisheries, coastline communities who live off this activity. Mr. Gosic. Dear colleagues, if a branch of the uh, economy, such as uh, artisanal and coastal fishing, has existed for so many hundreds of years, it means it is sustainable. We may not recall all the elements uh, influencing this um, sustainability, but uh, uh, practice will. Uh, uh, small artisanal and coastal fishing has uh, for thousands of years uh, produced food and supported life. I think we have to respect this historical aspect. If we have uh, influenced uh, with some other measures uh, the crisis uh, of uh, small uh, fisheries by reducing the space they have, the area they have for fishing, then I support the measures uh, which uh, uh, are proposed uh, to support uh, a small uh, fishing, uh, such as uh, uh, subsidizing fuel or uh, providing incentives for young people. But if uh, 
uh, we supply electronic equipment which is uh, uh, attractive to young people but in this way we have a negative impact on small fisheries so we have to uh, find another way to encourage uh, small fishing. I agree that centralization of uh, managing a fishery has led to bad results and that we have to empower small uh, coastal communities to make Make their own decisions uh, in this sector. I would also like to add that diversification is very important, that we have to find ways uh, to link up uh, small coastal fishing with other uh, activities uh, in order to maintain the qualities uh, of uh, small coastal fishing, which is very important, not just for maritime countries, but the entire European Union. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. I now give the floor to Gabriel Mato. Thank you, Chair. I'd also like to speak on behalf of Paco Millan, because he's in a tough spot right now, stuck in an airport. Just let me start by thanking the rapporteur, Jean Pimenta, for this report. We think it is a very accurate uh, depiction of the challenges being faced by the small-scale fisheries in the EU, and it raises a number of interesting points. In our group, we've always said that artisanal fisheries have specific features and specific needs, and they also have a huge social component, and they're important in maintaining traditions and our culture. I think one of the main successes of this parliament has been in ensuring in the new MFAF that there is support for small-scale coastal fisheries. So our members already have the opportunity to include in the program those particular needs of this type of fishery. Now, we don't want to have competition between small-scale and large-scale commercial fisheries. We think they can complement each other, and we need to defend both, really. There's another point, I think, here when it comes to um, reforming the, the fisheries controls, and this is a point made by Paco Millan as well, that reform is sometimes seen in negative light by small-scale coastal fisheries. They think that they don't take into account their vessels and their needs, which often fish just in inland waters and, or along the coasts, and there's no clear benefits in terms of controls. Now, Paco's also always said that you need to have geolocation, uh, GPS, uh, vessel monitoring, a uh, electronic data transfer, and that you need to have a specific uh, framework developed for the uh, small-scale fisheries. So we need to consider that they're different, they're unique, and we really need to build on existing practices which already work and are already controlled. There's a couple of other absolutely essential points which I must raise now. First, we need to ensure recognition of the uh, fisheries uh, cooperatives and associations and ensure that there's support of some sort for these fishermen's cooperatives as producer organizations uh, along the lines of the support that's provided for other forms of producer organizations. We think that's important. And second, this idea of a new tax on fuel within the framework of the uh, taxation uh, directive reform, we think if it were to be adopted, it would be very negative on the sector. It would result in a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis other regions which do not have such fuel taxes, and this would particularly affect small-scale fisheries. So we think we need to make a particular effort in order to support this fleet. Thank you. Uh, merci. Thank you. Ms. Bilbao has the floor now. Yes, hello. Thank you, Chair. And my thanks as well to the rapporteur for this report. I have a few comments of my own. First, the very title talks about the situation of small-scale fisheries in the EU and future prospects. I would like us to rem keep consistency in the text with what it says in the title, because it automatically switches this reference from small scale uh, artisanal fisheries to small scale fisheries. And this is a point that I've made on other occasions. In the Basque country, we have a fleet that does not fit in with the criteria that we've defined 
for, for instance, a vessel size in order to count as small-scale fishery. And yet, they fish, and have always fished, in line with artisanal fisheries practices. So, we don't think that they should be left out. They are fisheries, they are vessels that are very sustainable. They, for instance, will catch the tuna one by one individually, like in the old days. So, in line with uh, what the way the text is currently written, they'd be left out. So we need to ensure consistency there. And a second point. We think that artisanal vessels that ply coastal waters in small-scale fisheries should continue to benefit from support for fuel supply. It would seem that when the proposal in the current text, this would somehow change the status quo, because it says that there should be an opportunity for subsidies through maritime funds. But I think we need to continue to defend, as we have elsewhere in other committees in recent weeks and months, that they need to maintain these um, access to this support. And a third point, and this is something we've said on other occasions as well, and these fishermen's cooperatives should be understood really for what they are. They should also have access to the same sort of aid that uh, more formal fisheries organizations that are recognized. So once again, we think that this very important role, a very important form of organization, should be recognized. Fishermen's cooperatives in Spain, at least, are extremely important. Now to the question of women. It's not just a question of women working on vessels. The role of women in coastal and small-scale fisheries is huge. They do a lot of work. We talk about getting women more involved in the sector, but we also need to talk about recognition for the um, work they do as uh, assistants in packaging, canning, and other forms of uh, auxiliary work. This is something we've said in other reports, and I think it should be taken up here as well. There are a few sections now where there's a comparison made between destructive commercial intensive fisheries and small-scale fisheries, which is somehow implied to be better I think we need to remove that from this report because we need to have both industrial fisheries, which should be sustainable, and also a small-scale coastal fishery, which should be sustainable. And that's what we need to work on, and those are the efforts that the uh, sector are making. And so we need to try and ensure this is recognized here. So to oppose the two in this way, I think, is not appropriate. And that we really can't demonize a part of the fishery sector simply because it is industrial. It is so important. Also, we need to make the sector more uh, attractive to new generations. We've said this again on other occasions. It will be not attractive to young people if there's, they don't see any income in it. We see that fishery sectors where there is a profitability are the ones that young generations are interested in working in. So. Apart from creating this wish list, we also need to talk about specific measures that we can achieve. Increasing the value of products in the value chain is a very important point here. And here, I think we would once again need to talk about the whole question of labeling. Labeling the origin of the goods, because that is the best way to raise fisheries products um, that are fished in this way. Finally, innovation. We need to innovate. We need to help, for instance, that the um, engines on the vessels are more efficient, they're more sustainable, they're more effective. It's along the lines of what we're doing in other sectors. And here, we share the concern that's been expressed by other MEPs that we really do need to help the sector gain access to these types of aid and not put up barriers. We can't have a situation where aid is provided to um, engines where it's, there's this false equation made between greater horsepower is better fishing capacity. That is a false premise. And if we want to truly have a better fishing sector, we need to ensure that fishers can truly build the vessels that we need because that will also improve the sector as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Schreyer-Pirik has the floor now. 
Thank you, Chair. My thanks as well to the rapporteur. We think that this INI report has got some good points, but also some less good points. In the Netherlands, the small-scale fisheries and large-scale fisheries. And we think it's important that we consider socioeconomic factors for small-scale fisheries and call for investment for more innovation and energy efficiency and safety on board and generational change. Those are all good points. And your point, Chair, as well about access to funds is very important to us as well. We would support that principle too. But, but... What we don't like is this repeat insistence of giving the impression that small-scale fisheries is more environmentally friendly, is better, is more sustainable than industrial fisheries. And that's simply not so. And then opposed to this we is actually the opposite is true. If you look at, for instance, safety, it's clear to me that the larger fisheries uh, in Europe um, ensure better safety, uh, security of supply for food in the EU. That's something that we see. What, what is it exactly we're talking about? So should we stop fishing our own uh, uh, waters and just import fish to ensure security of food supply? Is that what we want? We can't measure it in terms of overall catches. And how can we have small-scale fisheries without large-scale fisheries as well? I think we need to be clear-eyed about this. It's not one against the other. It's one working with the other. And I will be tabling amendments to that effect. Thank you. Merci, Madame. Thank you, Ms. Rose, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair. And my thanks to the Rapporteur as well, Joao Pimenta Lopez, for this draft report. I would like to echo the comments made by Grace on behalf of Rosa D'Amato. It is important to remember the central role of small-scale artisanal fisheries to help our European people and to help our coastal and local communities both on land and at sea. As the rapporteur said, um, there are problems that are faced, for instance, uh, aging fissures, uh, lack of generational change. This is something we've discussed in other reports. And given this situation, there are a number of public policies that need to be applied. Small-scale artisanal fisheries need to be distinguished by uh, greater sustainability. And fishers who want to adopt uh, fishing techniques which are... Uh, less of an impact on ecosystems should be encouraged to do so through, for instance, increased f uh, allocation of fishing opportunities. In terms of sustainability, small-scale fisheries are not uh, threatened by uh, the they're threatened by overfisheries and by poor fishery stock management by industrial fisheries and by this laissez-faire approach by member states vis-a-vis -vis, uh, quotas by a small number of uh, fleets. This whole question of the short sales channels, that's very important for fishers. Direct sales from vessels or indirect markets. And that would have an effect on markets. This isn't a new story. We see this appearance of direct sales uh, platforms. In France, for instance, there's PostSky, which is a new platform. Consumers today are willing to spend more in order to eat better fish and support sustainable fisheries. And this will also ensure that fishermen will have a more stable, higher income. Now, I think that we need to put down this idea that uh, fewer controls uh, on fishers will help them. At one point, I think I heard some say that uh, electronic systems, monitoring systems, would be too complex for small-scale fishers. But if you look at Brexit, for instance, today, small-scale fishers are the ones really are the first to fall victim to Brexit in 20. 15 or before 2015, there was no VMS system, and now we're seeing it increasingly difficult for them because they don't receive fishing license for brishing waters as a result. So a lot remains to be done to preserve, but particularly to encourage small-scale fisheries and, and to be the fisheries of the future. And my thank you to the rapporteur for this excellent uh, report, which will help support small-scale fisheries. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues, for this interesting exchange. Now, I don't see any further requests for the floor, so I'll give the floor to uh, the representative of the European Commission, DJ Mare. You have the floor. Mrs. Anderson, can you press the speak button, please? Okay. Thank you very much. Huh? Thank you. I hope that you hear me now. Uh, thank you, Chair, and 
And thank you uh, to Mr. Limpantum Gropas for his draft report, which underlines indeed the importance of the small scale fisheries in the European Union, which, as we know, represents around 80% of the fishing fleet in number of vessels and also around 50% of the employment. Uh, we also know that the small scale fisheries, uh, moreover, shape the, the, the life of the coastal communities. This is a very important uh, report for us as well. And I would like just to make two points. Huh? Uh, first of all, um, that uh, the final report will provide very useful inputs for us for the preparation of the 2022 report on the functioning of the common fisheries policy. Um, it points to the need to strengthen the social dimension uh, of the CFP, and this is definitely a concern uh, when it comes to small-scale fisheries, uh, for whom the possibility to continue make a, a living out of fisheries activities safely in working conditions are among the main concerns. And I would like just to reassure everyone that this is something that we are looking very carefully into uh, in the European Commission. Um, as you know as well, uh, the regulation takes on board the specificities of small scale coastal fisheries. Uh, for example, member states may grant preferential access to the small scale um, fleet in the 12 nautical miles coastal band. And we have proposed an extension of this regime. Um, the small scale fleet is also exempted from a number of obligations that apply to larger vessels. Um, that's the first point concerning the CFP and the CFP report. I also would like to say a few words about the MFAF programming uh, indeed. Uh, the new regulation, which was uh, adopted in July, uh, maintained a specific focus on the needs of small scale uh, coastal uh, fisheries. Um, uh, for example, almost all projects uh, related to small scale coastal fishing can be supported with a rate of public aid of 100%. And member states must take into account the specific need of small-scale coastal fishing in their MFAF programming and describe the actions required for their development. And member states must also strive to improve simplified procedure for small-scale coastal fishing businesses applying for MFAF support. And here again, we are very much in DGMAR and now uh, very much involved in the first negotiations on the new um, generation of programs together with the member states. And we are giving uh, a huge priority also to make sure that the next generation of programs will take into account the needs of the small scale coastal fisheries and make the best use of the instruments available that we have now under the new uh, MFAF. Um, I also would like to underline uh, the role of small scale fisheries in the transition to more sustainable fisheries practices. Um, this means that in our efforts now, when we are um, working um, on the upcoming action plan to conserve fisheries resources and protect marine systems. It's also very important to think about what can be done when it comes to selectivity of the gears, etc., also for small scale uh, fisheries. Uh, we also have the revision of the control regulation, will also in, which also imp um, aims to improve the availability, reliability and completeness of the fisheries data, including of the small scale fisheries. And also here, um, MFAF can indeed support and accompany small-scale fisheries in this very important uh, transition. Thank you very much. Merci, Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Mr. Pimenta Lopez, we look forward to you uh, wrapping up this uh, discussion on small-scale fisheries with your concluding remarks. Thank you. Well, let me first of all thank uh, everybody for all of your input that you've put forward, not only by the shadow rapporteurs, but by the other colleagues who've spoken. I think we've got a, a very broad uh, base of understanding, let's call it that. And I think that we are in a position to be able to find a uh, uh, a point uh, of agreement uh, after, of course, the tabling of all the amendments so that we can uh, uh, s uh, safeguard uh, small-scale fishing. Let me just uh, point to a couple of uh, issues that have been raised, a couple of questions. Considerations that are made. This idea, for example, that uh, we are aiming to create a kind of contradiction between small-scale fishing and large-scale fishing. No, 
we're not uh, talking about any kind of confrontation. We're simply outlining the data. These are well-known facts. Basically, we're saying don't treat things that are different in the same way. It's uh, quite clear in the report, a small-scale fishing uh, covers 76% of active uh, vessels, 8% uh, of gross tonnage. That's an, only 5% of total landings within the EU. Now, if we take into account uh, that uh, landings uh, just in uh, EU member states, we're talking about around 6% of uh, 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 small-scale fishing. This is 76% of active vessels, vis-à-vis 24% of uh, fishing uh, uh, catches on a large scale, so industrial fishing. Now, of course, I agree with some of the considerations that have been made here that sometimes simple restriction of uh, small-scale fishing below 12 metres does create certain situations. But even if we adjust the characterization of what exactly uh, small-scale fishing is so that they can cover certain uh, segments uh, above uh, 12 uh, uh, metres so they can still be considered to be small-scale fishing and be brought into artisanal fishing concept, the disproportion between the landings of a small-scale fishing and those of large-scale fishing is, is quite plain to see. We talk so much about sustainability of fishing, the need to uh, protect uh, resources, to double the uh, uh, if we double resources, it's inevitable to make a distinction between the impacts from one type of fishing and the impacts of another kind of fishing. I think it's also quite clear that there is a totally disproportionate uh, support provided to the small-scale fishing and uh, large-scale fishing. We held a meeting with DG Mare on this matter and we're very grateful uh, for the elements that have been sent in by them and the input. It's uh, very easy to underline uh, basically what was said uh, in the previous fund. 38% of, uh, of support went to small-scale uh, fishing vessels, but in terms of the funds and interrelation between the funds, only 25% of uh, support from the previous funds went to small-scale fishing, when in fact it is the majority of the segment. And uh, it's also the segment that uh, has the least uh, financial capacity to be able to meet its needs. So we think it's uh, plain to see, and I'll end on this point, that... Uh, we need uh, to bet on this uh, segment for its future, not only because of its cultural, socio-economic uh, dimensions, the transformation of uh, the uh, situation of many communities. Many cities in the coastal uh, regions of the EU wouldn't be what they are without the input of fishing, particularly small-scale fishing. So we do need to have a, a position where we make a clear distinction between things and uh, clearly recognize and highlight the difference between small-scale fishing and the need uh, for a differential treatment. So just to uh, uh, come back to what uh, Gabriel Mato said, unfortunately it's not uh, been uh, set uh, in this uh, MFAF, the initial uh, position of the Commission was to have a specific uh, article on uh, uh, the uh, small-scale fishing and that didn't make it to the final version. So we need to have, there is a specific mention of a small-scale fishing but it's diluted if you like, it's watered down within the other funds and there are there's a, a lot of uh, very heavy burdens particularly in terms of red tape as the Chairman said and the Commissioner said, the costs 
in terms of preparing applications for MFAF funds, very often in themselves, they, uh, they're dissuasory. They put people off going for the funds. So I think we really, really need to make uh, uh, things uh, easier. We need to provide a training for everybody and uh, shine the light on all these different issues that have come to the fore. Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much, Mr. Pimenta Lopez. So we can close that uh, item on the agenda and uh, set uh, the date for tabling amendments the 17th of November, of uh, December rather. And uh, this will go to the vote in, uh, for the final report uh, in uh, April 2022. So let's uh, move to the final point. We've got half an hour to look at uh, the uh, two delegated acts that are on the agenda. So we have uh, uh, two uh, colleagues uh, who are going to speak to us about the use of uh, uh, exotic uh, and locally uh, uh, absent and uh, fishing and aquaculture Concerning the date of admissibility of the support, we have a cut-off date for objections set at two months from the official notification for the first 26 December 2021 and the other 5th of January 2022 for these two implementing acts. So, I'd ask you, please, uh, colleagues, to take uh, the floor. First of all, talk about uh, aquaculture and the use of exotic uh, species. Uh, perhaps you could be brief in your outlining your points. Thank you. Ms. Tanik Valerie, please press the speaker button. Uh, yes, good morning. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. I'm uh, there to speak about the uh, delegated act under the MFAF. Um, so this is the second delegated act uh, that, that has come to you. Uh, we are also working on the uh, implementing acts for the regulation to be sure that the whole system is in place uh, now that member states are adopting the programs. So what is this delegated act about? It is about the uh, uh, rules on the inadmissibility of operators for funding. Uh, this act uh, already exists under the current programming, so under the EMFF, uh, and what it does, it sets the thresholds uh, for when operators become inadmissible to receive funding. The principle uh, of this, uh, this, this act and this provision in the MFAF comes from uh, the CFP regulation itself, Article 42, which states clearly that union financial assistance to operators shall be conditional upon compliance with the CFP rules by the operators. Um, like we have in the current uh, period, um, this, this rule is there to protect the union's financial interest, but also work as a deterrent against serious infringements and help uh, ensure better compliance with the rules. Uh, in terms of the cases for which uh, the um, inadmissibility is triggered, so this concerns serious infringements as defined in the control regulation and the IAU regulation. It concerns cases where vessels are included in the union IAU vessel list. It concerns for aquaculture, environmental uh, offensives and cases of fraud. Um, the act that you have in front of you doesn't uh, differ so much from the current um, uh, period. Uh, especially not for what concerns IUU, environmental offenses and fraud, uh, but it is slightly different in its functioning uh, as to how many infringements trigger the inadmissibility and the duration of the uh, inadmissibility. Um, We've been looking at what member states have been doing so far in applying this act. They all have systems in place, but the actual uh, implementation is slightly different. Um, 
what we have now in this act, uh, it puts the threshold for triggering inadmissibility uh, on two or more serious infringements. This is in line with the regulation itself, so the MFAF regulation. Uh, the threshold is reduced to one serious infringement in case of some of the very serious serious infringements. So in, in the control regulation, some cases of serious infringements have seven or more points. So those are considered the most serious. And for those, it will be triggered immediately. Uh, and a serious infringements with no points uh, under the control and the IUU regulation, but which have a particularly damaging uh, uh, effect for, for, uh, in terms of their uh, nature. Um, I think there's not so much uh, more to say on this. The act is very technical. It's been discussed uh, several times with the member states to be really sure it works well. Uh, and so ultimately it will be for the managing authorities in the member states to ensure compliance and work closely with their control authorities. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, madam. Are there any questions, any comments concerning this uh, delegated act? I think Madame Conte wanted to say something in the coordinators meeting. Is she still there? Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, yes, I'm talking about the delegated act on the MFAF. Uh, is that what I, is this the right uh, point to talk about that? Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's that, now's the time. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'll be very direct. This uh, delegated act proposed by the Commission concerns the inadmissibility period uh, for the MFAF. We don't like it. As we said in the coordinators meeting this morning, I think uh, that it uh, uh, risks uh, having an impact uh, on. Uh, a devastating impact on our fish uh, men and women. Uh, look at the uh, provision, the general, that uh, there should be two uh, serious infringements uh, with a fewer than seven points uh, before inadmissibility is triggered. That's, it's not good that the admissibility period is at two months uh, per point. Uh, that's uh, excessive. It needs to be modulated. Uh, depending uh, on what's said in uh, 11.4, Article 11.4 of the MFAF, the nature, gravity and duration of the infringement. The Commission uh, is uh, basing on 11.4 of the uh, MFAF to talk about uh, des uh, the definition of the thresholds for admissibility and the period by the, the uh, presentation of support and request. But what about proportionality? It doesn't respect proportionality. The MFAF regulation says that uh, you have to follow the proportionality principle based on the nature, the seriousness, the duration, reiteration of serious infringements uh, or violations or uh, fraud committed over a minimum of one year. The same uh, is considered uh, in uh, the terms of uh, recovering uh, support uh, after the presentation of the request. Uh, also in that case the uh, modalities uh, for recuperation or recovery must be in line with the uh, uh, nature, the uh, 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 seriousness and the duration of these. Uh, so I don't think in any of this case it really applies to uh, proportionality except for these uh, two months uh, for the uh, infringements that you mentioned. Now, it's not easy to find a coherent and uh, effective and applicable and easily uh, checkable system to, uh, on uh, the grounds of the MFAF uh, regulation, but uh, it's not a question uh, of making sanctions less dissuasive, as some people say, but to stop uh, uh, or avoid uh, basically uh, adding another nail to the coffin of uh, fishermen who have involuntarily uh, infringe these uh, uh, points. Uh, this is uh, uh, this concerns uh, errors in uh, making uh, in filling in your uh, logbook or the FAO rules. Now, what's proposed is a heavier burden than the previous delegated act concerning the MFAF from 2015 to 2018, and it's uh, true that inadmissibility 
did uh, was triggered at the first infringement, uh, uh, not the second. However, this has uh, had uh, it uh, was uh, triggered at nine points, uh, whereas here it would be triggered at seven uh, or at the limit of six uh, infringements. So when two infringements have been committed uh, as uh, listed in the annex, so what we need to do, I think, is make a distinction between uh, uh, the uh, uh, whether these things are done intentionally or unintentionally. And this is a sacred principle. Uh, so we look at uh, the whether this uh, uh, illicit or uh, non-conformant behaviours have been repeated uh, less than seven points, and therefore the nature and the gravity of the infringement itself. Uh, so. To improve, I would say, to improve the situation, I would say you could look at certain type of infringements uh, and the first two infringements uh, just uh, uh, give one month of inadmissibility rather than two months. And that would um, pick up uh, the proportionality principle that's in the basis, uh, basic regulation. Uh, that would be in line with the previous uh, MFAF, which is what the Commission wants. And I'd like to be able to. I'd like to hear what they uh, feel about that. And we need to look at this again. I think this uh, uh, committee should uh, be against this proposal. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Are there any further requests uh, to take the floor on this? Uh, apparently not. Um, Ankin, would you like to come back to this? Uh, do you have any uh, further comments to make on this? Yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for those comments. Maybe just uh, first to come back to what we're talking here about, because ultimately this is about serious infringement. So already a very serious nature. Uh, it's about protecting the financial interest. But also I think it is in terms of how do we perceive overall compliance of fishery, uh, the fishing sector. Um, when I'm listening to the comments, there is somehow an assumption of uh, a variety of people infringing, whereas I think the majority of them do comply with the rules and do comply fully, and uh, where things go wrong occasionally, most of it it's not a serious infringement, or even if it is, there's always a margin of discretion for the control authorities to see how they apply it. The MFAF uh, inadmissibility only triggers in when the control authorities have established that the infringement is committed, a serious infringement is committed, uh, and only then, uh, under the rules set out in the Delegated Act, uh, inadmissibility will be triggered with two, infringement, two, two of such infringements, or for the very serious, so more than seven points, uh, for one. That's fully in line, or at least the Commission considers this to be fully in line with the proportionality principle. And uh, what we've been seeing so far, and from all the discussions we've had in the expert group, also member states agree that this would be uh, a fair, proportionate and appropriate way to handle. So I think it's it's a matter of how these things will be uh, applied in practice. And of course, the Commission will be closely looking at that. But uh, I can assure you that uh, this, this is fully compatible with the proportionality principle. Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much. Well, the objections uh, will be decided upon in the coordinators uh, as appropriate. Are there any further questions? If not, I propose that we move on to the next uh, uh, delegated. Uh, Madame de la Cruz, uh, you have the uh, floor. Everyone, um, uh, I think you can hear me well. Très bien. Perfectly. That's okay. okay. Let me, if I may, let me let me uh, address your, address you in, in English. Um, yes, uh, I would like to start by introducing a bit the, this uh, delegated regulation adopted by the Commission uh, in in October. Uh, this relates to uh, Regulation Seven O Eight uh, um, Two Thousand and Seven that uh, regulates the introduction uh, and translocation of alien species and locally absent species. Uh, for use in aquaculture. Uh, as you may know, it's, it's a, a regulation that aims at avoiding that there is, uh, let's say, damage to the environment or biodiversity by the introduction of, the, of this type of uh, alien species or 
or locally absent species uh, by uh, establishing certain criteria for the introduction and translocation, notably a uh, system of permits. Um, this uh, regulation has a, an annex, that is Annex 4, that is the one that is being uh, the, the object of amendment by the, the delegated uh, regulation, which contains the list of species that have been commonly uh, uh, used in aquaculture uh, in, in parts of the Union. Uh, with no uh, significant adverse effects. Uh, and for this uh, species listed in Annex 4, uh, the requirement to have a permit doesn't apply. It's a, it's a kind of derogation because of the fact that this, these species have been, have been used for a long time in, in the EU already. So uh, the, the delegated uh, regulation uh, comes in fact uh, following uh, a request by Greece uh, to introduce a new species in this list, in this annex, that is uh, red sea bream, uh, Pagus major in, in Latin. Uh, the Greek authorities provided information uh, that uh, according to the assessment they did, the scientific assessment they did, this has been found since uh, 85 uh, in, in Greece uh, and uh, with no significant adverse effects. Uh, so this complies with the, with the conditions for adding a species to the to the list, we assessed the information the commission that was provided by the Greek authorities that we consider that adding these new species was justified uh, on the basis of the information provided by the Greek authorities. We have also uh, taken the opportunity of this um, amendment uh, of the annex of the regulation to have a look at whether there were other pending issues that need to be uh, needed to be uh, addressed in relation to this regulation. Uh, we had a consultation with member state experts on aquaculture and as a result we identified also some technical issues that needed to be fixed in the annex in terms of the terminology used for the certain species and also uh, we considered that it was necessary to clarify that this annex uh, um, uh, provides a derogation for the species listed in the annex itself and not for those that are, that are hybrids of the species listed in the annex. So for those hybrids between species listed in annex four, that we will have to apply the same uh, procedure as for adding a new species in the annex. Uh, so this is essentially the purpose of this uh, delegated regulation. Um, we have also been uh, uh, presenting this, uh, this uh, delegated regulation uh, as a draft to, to the Committee on Fisheries and Aquaculture um so um i think i will leave it here if you have any questions obviously i'm, I'm very happy to reply thank you Merci, cher madame. thank you for the presentation of this delegated act does anyone want to ask a question or make a comment whether in the room or connected i don't see any this was clear as day so thank you very much. It's 11.43. We have gone through the agenda for this morning. I will see you at 1.45 uh, with the hearing. It's going to be on recreational fishing. So it's not professional fishing. Data collection in recreational fishing. I'll see you at 1.45 for two hours.